Well, as we come to look at that this morning, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for the, the challenge and inspiration that is contained in the book of Jeremiah. And as we come to look at this uh, chapter 32, our prayer is that you would speak afresh its truth into our hearts this day. And we pray this in your name. Amen. At the start of each year, supporters of every football team in the AFL are invited to buy club memberships. The marketing that goes into the sale of footy club memberships is enormous because memberships are a key income earner for football clubs. There's also a degree of bragging rights that takes place later in the year when the number of memberships are declared to see who had the most. And one of the common arguments presented in the marketing for buying a membership is the hope and expectation of your team winning the premiership. And every football supporter wants to experience the euphoria of their club winning a premiership. And so there is a fairly emotive dimension to buying a club membership. Though in reality, this is a relevant strategy only for about half the clubs in the AFL who are in what is referred to as that premiership window. Uh, for those not in the premiership window, the marketing focuses on providing the resources needed to you know, rebuild the team. Uh, for clubs who have experienced some previous success but are now in the bottom half of the ladder, you know, the focus on rebuilding for the future is quite strong. And so club membership is treated as an investment that's going to bring about a return in the not too distant future. In the AFL, however, there is one club whose membership continues to challenge all of the general marketing strategies. The club sits in that middle group, not likely to win a premiership, but also not really rebuilding. In terms of historical success, they're the club who have the longest premiership drought of any team. 57 years since they last won their only one premiership, despite being a part of the AFL, VFL for 150 years. Anyone guess which team we're talking about? That's St Kilda. Any St Kilda supporters here? No, there you go. Well, supporters of St Kilda, I think, live with a long history of defeat and disappointment. Uh, the closest they have come to success in recent years was back in 2010 with the drawn grand final against Collingwood, and which they then proceeded to lose badly in the replay the following week. Over the past few years, you know, I know a secured supporter, so he tells me this every year, they start each season winning strongly at the start, only to fall apart halfway through the season, shattering the dreams of their supporters. Though last night was a bit unexpected <laughs> for all you Geelong supporters. That was a bit of a shock, wasn't it? <laughs> well, in view of the uh, usual reasons for buying a club membership, which is the expectation of premiership success, you know, why do St Gilda supporters continue to buy memberships? Now, most will say, well, we do it out of loyalty to the club because we've always supported them, so we'll take out the membership. But there are those who will still do it because it is an expression of hope. I will take out the club membership in the hope that this is the year. You know, this word hope gets thrown around a lot these days, but sadly the power of the word has been diminished by its somewhat flippant use. More often than not, what is described as a hope by people is really just wishful thinking. And such expressions of hope are often quite shallow as they tend to be just fleeting desires with little impact on how life is lived. Real hope, however, is very different. Real hope is not wishful thinking, but rather it is tangible action. Real hope is an action that takes place in the present on the basis of a future that in the current moment seems impossible. Real hope is an action that takes courage, as it often has no defined time frame for its realisation. 
Now, while every other AFL club can look to recent premiership successes, or if they are like one of the newer clubs, a shorter period of premiership drought, St Kilda has neither of those realities. And yet, despite that, their supporters will take out club memberships at the start of each year. And while it is an expression of club loyalty, it is still an expression of hope grounded in the action of taking out a membership when the likelihood of premiership success is totally uncertain. Well, when we turn to Jeremiah 32, which is our reading for today, we encounter a somewhat different message to what we tend to encounter when we read and encounter the ministry of Jeremiah. Now, for the vast majority of his ministry, Jeremiah fulfills that description of being, you know, the prophet of doom. Everything he has to say is about judgment, misery, and so forth. And through the reigns of the last four kings of Judah, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, Jeremiah preaches a message of judgment. And Jeremiah is that, you know, disturbing voice that confronts the people of Judah with the reality of God's judgment that is coming their way in the destructive power of Babylon. And the constant refrain in Jeremiah's preaching throughout this period is the call of the nation to repentance. Now that's a hard call for the people to accept because you know, they like the way they are living, even if it's in breach of all of God's commands. And the misleading beliefs that they hold on to, they find far more comforting than Jeremiah's call to repentance. And so the negativity of Jeremiah's messages are very well known. And the kings of Judah in particular especially despise them. But this negativity disappears in this surprising chapter, which we have the account of Jeremiah investing in some real estate in his home village of Anathoth. Now, instead of the usual message of judgment and doom, what we encounter in Jeremiah 32 is a profound action that is a statement of hope. Now, in verses 1 and 2, we are given one of those historical reference points that helps us to understand where this action of Jeremiah fits in in the bigger picture of the ancient Near East. We read that it's now the 10th year of the reign of Zedekiah, which places this action by Jeremiah somewhere around about the year 588 BC. Now, to say the least, a lot has happened since we last looked at Jeremiah last week in chapter 36, that events that took place in 605 BC. And if you're working out the dates and the chapter numbers, then it's a reminder as to why you can't read Jeremiah chronologically because the events in chapter 32 take place in 588 BC and the events in chapter 36 take place in 605 BC. So you just can't go with the flow. But after defeating the Egyptians at Carchemish in 605 BC, the Babylonians quickly worked their way south into Palestine, where the kingdom of Judah under the reign of Jehoiakim becomes another vassal state of Babylon. And that state of affairs lasts for about three years before Jehoiakim foolishly decides to rebel against the Babylonians who proceed to defeat him, take him into exile in Babylon in 598 BC, leaving his son Jehoiakim to be the new king of Judah. Well, Jehoiakim, however, lasts three months as king. He too is then taken into exile by the Babylonians. And so the Babylonians then make his uncle Mataniah the next king of Judah and then decide to change his name to Zedekiah. And for the next 11 years, the kingdom of Judah under Zedekiah exists as a vassal nation, politically subject to Babylon. And while this gave the people of Judah a degree of freedom, they were no longer an independent nation. And this state of affairs lasts for about 10 years. But around about 588 BC, there is a movement in the politics of the ancient Near East. The Egyptians who had been defeated a decade earlier, start to make some incursions into the southern boundaries of the Babylonian Empire. And those boundaries lay south of the kingdom of Judah. And so for a brief moment, the attention of the Babylonians shifts south 
to the threat from the Egyptians. Now, for Zedekiah, this emergence of the Egyptian threat seems to present an opportune time to maybe rebel against the Babylonians. Now, despite everything Jeremiah has preached about the doom that's going to come, Zedekiah thinks that he can create a new future. And so he rebels. It is a decision that turns out to be a disaster for the kingdom of Judah. Because once the Babylonians deal with the Egyptians, which didn't take very long, they turn their attention back to Jerusalem, where they lay siege and then finally destroy the city and the temple in 587 BC, exactly as Jeremiah had warned. Now, as depressing as all of these events are for the kingdom of Judah, a small window of freedom exists there in 588 BC while the Babylonians are distracted and trying to deal with the Egyptians down south. And it's in this brief window that we have the actions of Jeremiah in response to the command of God. And so while the Babylonians are putting Jerusalem to the siege and fighting off the Egyptians, Jeremiah is confined in the palace guardhouse where the king has ready access to him. And Zedekiah, despite not liking Jeremiah's message, continues to have various encounters with Jeremiah to sound him out, to talk to him. And they're described in the book of Jeremiah. There's a number of encounters that he has. And in chapter 32, we have another one of those encounters between Zedekiah and Jeremiah. And with the city under siege, Jeremiah under arrest, Zedekiah goes to Jeremiah to ask him a question that basically outlines the message of judgment that Jeremiah has been declaring to the kingdom of Judah for many years. Zedekiah wants to know why Jeremiah keeps on pronouncing God's judgment on the city. And the only reply Jeremiah can make is, well, it's the word of God. I'm just the spokesperson for the word of God. Well, it's into this complex drama of empires and kings we suddenly have this very personal moment where Jeremiah is told that his nephew Hannibal is going to come and offer Jeremiah the chance to buy a field in his home village of Anathoth. Because in this brief window of 588 BC, the siege of Jerusalem is loose enough for Hannibal to make his way into the city to see Jeremiah. Now, in terms of land speculation, the invitation to Jeremiah to buy this field of Anathoth is probably one of the worst land offers ever made in history. Not only is this transaction taking place in the midst of a major military conflict, the land itself is occupied by the Babylonian army. And with Jeremiah's long ministry of announcing judgment on the kingdom of Judah, there is no indication of any productive future for the owner of this land. Jeremiah, however, ignores all the dire circumstances that surround him and follows through with the purchase of this block of land, a purchase that we are given an amazing amount of detail about so that we may appreciate that this is a very deliberate action taken by Jeremiah. And so a deed of sale is drawn up, a price of 17 shekels of silver is paid, all the documentation as you would expect in a land sale, it is witnessed, it is signed, it is sealed, and Baruch, who gets another mention, is given instructions by Jeremiah to gather all these documents, put them into a clay jar so that they may be preserved for a long period. Now, from a human perspective, this purchase of land by Jeremiah seems to be one of the dumbest things anyone could do. In this moment, Jeremiah is a prisoner in a city under siege that has very little to look forward to in terms of its future. The land itself, occupied by the Babylonian army, for all intents and purposes, has no value and has no future value ahead of it. So why does Jeremiah buy what for all intents and purposes is a useless piece of land that has no future prospects? Well, this radical action of Jeremiah not only contradicts his constant preaching of judgment, 
but also the expectation everyone has of the future. Because this purchase of land in his home village is actually a profound act of hope. An act of hope that is unexpected and which defies every rational thought that anyone would have concerning it. Now in the prayer and narrative that fills out the rest of this chapter from verse 16, we're given insight into the dynamics that surround this purchase of land. And while there is recognition that the behaviour of the people of Judah has led to their destruction at the hand of the Babylonians, and there is confirmation that this destruction is an expression of God's judgment, this act of judgment turns out to not be the final word of God. This God who judges his people for their disobedience now gives a word of hope for a future life beyond the current destruction and exile. This destruction by the Babylonians will not mark the end of God's relationship with his people, but it will be a refining moment in this story. There will be a future for God's people, but it will be a future created by God who will bring his people into a new relationship. And so there is reference in these verses to a new covenant between God and his people, which we'll look at in a few weeks' time, to a new future filled with blessing and restoration. You know, the land and the vineyards will once again be fruitful. They'll be sold as part of a revitalised economy. And the imagery Jeremiah presents is quite profound and is almost the exact opposite to all the declarations of judgment he has made. But this act of hope is a revelation of God because this God is not just a God of judgment and justice. He is also a God of mercy and grace. And so Jeremiah buys a block of land at a time that makes no sense whatsoever. It's a block of land that he has no control over. It's a block of land he will never get to see, dominated by the invading forces of Babylon. And yet in that purchase of land, we encounter one of the most powerful actions of hope that we have in Jeremiah. Now, this action of hope, you know, it may have spoken to those under siege in Jerusalem, but it was its most powerful message came to those once they were taken into exile. And it's an action that I think challenges us today to think about what it means for us to live out the truth of hope. You know, as Christians, we are called by God to be a people of hope. You know, that's the truth of the resurrection of Jesus announces to us. That in the face of the destructive power of death, there is life in Jesus, who is the risen Lord. It's also the truth of the second coming of Jesus that announces that there is a future coming that transcends everything that we see. And so the Christian gospel is a message of hope. It's a message that we and our wider community need to hear, especially in these days of uncertainty and struggle. But the message of hope is not something limited to words alone. The message of hope needs to be revealed in actions, actions that may make no sense in the current context, which seem futile in view of the uncertain nature of the future but which will connect us to the promises of God and his kingdom. Now, Eugene Peterson, in his book, Run With Horses, makes this insightful comment when he says that hope is buying into what we believe. That hope is not something we just talk about. Hope is not a nice idea that we just read about in our Bibles. Biblical hope is acting in our lives on the basis of what we believe about the promises of God. Hope is a dynamic action that gives substance to our trust in the promises of God. Now, for Jeremiah, the purchase of land was the dynamic action of expressing his trust in the promises of God. The act itself made no sense in its current context but it makes all the sense in the world when it is connected to the promise of God. It may have been an action that incurred the ridicule of others as being a really dumb thing that Jeremiah has just done. 
But this is the nature of hope. It often goes against the stream of things that everyone sees. Well, if we are to be a people of hope, then we need to engage in actions that give substance to the hope that is ours in Jesus. And these actions will make little sense in the current times, but they will point to a future that is beyond our capacity to bring about. There will be actions that centre on the reality of the kingdom of God and on the future that will be a work of God. So what actions of hope are we challenged to engage in? There's many, but there's just four I want to touch on this morning. The first is the act of baptism. Now, we often talk of baptism being a sign of our repentance and our acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord. But there is more going on in our baptism. In the act of baptism, we are declaring that our lives are connected to a kingdom that we cannot see and that our eternity destiny is secure in Jesus, even though we may not see any tangible signs of that future in our current situation. And so the act of baptism then is an act of hope. It looks to a future that is a work of God, and so it remains as an expression of hope in action. On a more practical level, there is our Kids Hope Ministry. Now, our Kids Hope mentors have the opportunity of bringing hope into the lives of some of the most broken children of our community. Now, we have no control over the outcomes of this ministry to these children, nor are we able to know the long-term impacts of this ministry to these children. But these mentor relationships are actions of hope to these children in a current situation of hopelessness. It is hope in action. A third one is care for the environment. Now, this action is greatly influenced by how we interpret the biblical promise of a new earth. There are those who believe that the promise of a new earth involves the total annihilation of the current earth and there being a new act of creation by God. Those who hold to that interpretation tend to not engage in any care of the environment because they see it as pointless. If God's going to annihilate everything, then why bother doing any care for it now? There are those, on the other hand, who believe that the promise of a new earth means it is an act of renewal of the current earth by God. And therefore, they see any engagement in acts of environmental care as actually actions of hope that look to what God was going to do at some point in the future. They see those actions of hope giving expression to the reality of the kingdom of God is a part of their Christian expression. And then the fourth area is in the area of justice and reconciliation. Now, these are key attributes and qualities of the kingdom of God, of justice and reconciliation. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be engaged in these actions that seek to bring about justice and reconciliation. But this is never easy because any work of justice will involve challenging those who currently hold positions of power. Any work on reconciliation means confronting past actions that have caused pain and suffering. An example of how difficult these actions of hope can be in the area of justice and reconciliation I think is evident in the current polarising debate on the voice referendum that's going to be held in October. You know, a long process over many decades that included many conversations amongst the Indigenous communities culminated in that 2017 Uluru Statement of the Heart. The statement, if you actually read it, and most people have not read it, it's only a page long, it's an invitation to all Australians to come together to create a new future filled with justice for and reconciliation with our First Nations people. The next part of that long journey, and it will be a long journey, is the creation of a voice in the Constitution. 
The journey ahead will also include the confronting truth-telling which needs to take place in order there to be effective reconciliation. Everyone has a view on this coming referendum. But we each have the responsibility to ensure that our view is informed by the truth and not by the disinformation that is appallingly out there. And as Christians, we need to look not through the lens of partisan politics, but we need to look at this issue through the lens of the kingdom of God. Now, what this long process to the voice is all about, when you really cut to the very core of what it's about, it's about justice and reconciliation. These are attributes of the kingdom of God. And as such, many Christians see a vote for the voice as an action of hope. An action of hope that almost seems futile, given the prevailing polarizing debate that plagues our nation. But it's an action of hope that looks to a future that will be a work of God. Now, the challenge we face with all of our actions of hope is that we cannot see or control the future they point to. These actions of hope may not make any sense in the current moment. These actions of hope challenge us to live in ways that are countercultural to the society in which we live. Now, just like Jeremiah is buying a piece of land in the midst of a siege. But Jeremiah reminds us in chapter 32 that real hope is not an idea. It's not a word. Real hope is an action that takes place in our lives because of what we believe about Jesus and his kingdom. And so as followers of Jesus, we are challenged to live hope-filled lives so that those amongst whom we live may believe in the future that God will bring about, a future that is filled with love, grace, compassion, and justice of God. We may not see signs of those qualities of the kingdom of God in our world today, but we are called to live out our lives on the basis of those qualities. Because that's what it means to be a people of hope in our community today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we, we reflect on the challenge of hope. It is your profound gift to us that there is a future beyond what we see. And we are to live out our lives now on the basis of what is to come. Never an easy thing to do. But we pray, Lord, that you would give us courage, give us discernment, that we might be truly a people of hope by the lives we live. And invite people then to see how we live and see the hope that lies in God. So continue to speak to us about this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.